Just to start off with a bit of an update around what we're seeing on open banking, we've decided to start tracking um, open banking from an awareness perspective. So every quarter we're getting a read on the extent to which customers are aware of different terms. We've been tracking awareness of the term open banking for quite a while now. Um, We're also tracking awareness of the term consumer data right. What we see in our research at the moment, we pick up about uh, 20% of consumers who said, I've heard that term open banking before. Uh, We pick up 15% of consumers who say, I've heard the term consumer data right before. That hasn't changed too significantly recently. So we've seen numbers around uh, around those uh, those numbers probably for the last year or so. Um, there is a bit of an age skew to this, so younger consumers are more likely to indicate that they've heard those terms. Um, but I think importantly here, this is just awareness of a term does not necessarily mean that there is a high level of understanding of what these terms means. And actually, when you start to dig into this, the extent to which customers actually understand what open banking means is quite low. So we we see a very small proportion of consumers who understand what open banking means, either in terms of being able to correctly identify what open banking is in terms of of just data sharing at a high level, um, but an even small proportion who really understand um, the the mechanics behind it or the mechanisms behind it um, and the idea that it's sharing data in order to access different services. So awareness is is kind of, is kind of there. There is a a proportion of the market who've heard those terms before, um, but I think importantly, um, awareness is not equal understanding. We do see very low rates of understanding in the market. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit more as we go through and whether or not that's that's important. I think that there is a a key point here around um, how you build customer trust. Um, Having customers understanding how open banking CDR works is is definitely important to building trust, Uh, but probably more importantly than that, having really clear uh, benefits for customers, I think is, is really the key in terms of how we get open banking um, or or customers adopting open banking services. We also have started to track consumer um, uptake of open banking services and what we've decided to do is to really focus in on aggregation services. So are you using any type of app, any type of service that allows you to view and all of your bank accounts across multiple providers in one view? Sort of the easiest way for a customer to think about what open banking is, it's the easiest way for us to identify it. we are starting to pick up consumers using these types of services. Again, very small proportion. So only 2% said that they've used um, one of those types of services. And if you look at the right-hand side there, the type of services we pick up, there's a bit of a mix in there in terms of um, using CDR um, or using um, screen scraping, even within those services. Frollo, um, for example, of course, using using both CDR and, um, and screen scraping. Um, when we look at those types of services, there is a, a bit of a theme coming through there around customers using it not just to view their accounts, but more so to to understand what is happening in terms of their banking. So are customers interested in open banking is the other um, point to this. It's one thing to have awareness, it's one thing to have understanding, but is there interest in actually one, sharing data, um, but using and utilising the services that are available under open banking? At a very high level, when we look at the extent to which consumers are interested in giving their consent to share their data under either open banking or under CDR, and both of those we've described at a very high level for consumers, um, a proportion of customers who are, who are very interested or who are um, willing to do that at the moment is relatively low. We see about 10% of consumers saying, yes, I'd be comfortable with sharing my data in order to access the benefits um, of open banking or of CDR. That number also really hasn't moved in the last couple of years. Um, it's remained at around 10% pretty consistently over time. There is, however, a significantly greater proportion of customers who are open to understanding more. So we see about 50% when we're talking about CDR. And CDR, we, I should say, we, we do um, pose as sort of being um, as being regulation, um, 36% uh, for open banking. Um, but a, again, a, a relatively sizable proportion of the population who say, I'm not really there in terms of sharing my data, but I I would like to know more. And if there was the right proposition, potentially that would change my mind. Which brings me on to propositions and use cases for open banking. Um, I think there is a key one around helping customers with financial management. As I said, that aggregation service um, sort of already already does that to to an extent, helping customers to view all of their accounts across providers. There are, of course, lots of other use cases for open open banking, um, but I'll I'll focus mostly on this one in in the last few slides here. The first one I want to make, um, what I showed you on that previous slide, the extent to which consumers are willing to share their data in in order to able high level benefits of open banking or CDR. So I'm willing to share my data in return for for better services and better products and and recommendations and things like that. 
that was relatively low. Once we start to go into specific use cases, we see a completely different story. Um, so across these different use cases that we've tested here, and these are sort of the general ones that get spoken about in terms of um, in terms of CDR, um, you get closer to 50% of consumers who say, this is actually something that's very appealing to me, um, and I would be willing to share my data in order to access these services. So if we think about trust and what consumers are willing to do, um, the hesitancy that customers have around sharing their data, if that, if that key benefit is there, if it's demonstrated to customers what they'll get out of sharing their data, that really shifts um, the market or, or changes the game in terms of what customers are willing to do in the extent to which they are willing to share their data. So I think having really clear benefits for customers, having really good services is going to be really key in terms of driving um, up uptake of open banking and probably more so than actually whether we do see widespread awareness of the term um, or if we see widespread understanding of the term, having that really clear benefit is going to be what's key to driving that, that uptake. To wrap up really in terms of what we're seeing around um, PFM and, and budgeting and financial management, um, what we've been looking at, and this again, quite consistently over time, we do see consumers having a, um, a real pain point or a real uh, customer problem around managing their money, in particular, younger customers. So millennials, Gen Z, even um, into the sort of early parts of Gen X, there is a significant proportion of customers there who consider tracking their finances to be difficult. And for a wide range of reasons, some of it is, I just think it's boring, I don't want to do it. Some of it is I'm doing things in so many different ways. I'm using so many different payment methods. I'm using so many different bank accounts. I just find it hard to keep track. Um, some of it, I just don't feel like I have the resources or I, I simply don't know how to budget. Um, so a key, uh, a key problem that, that persists for customers, in particular for younger customers, um, and a range of things that they're really looking for in terms of that support around uh, budgeting, managing their money better. The other key thing here is we are starting to see customers ask for PFM functionality from their bank. Um, this is a verbatim question where we said to customers, what would you like from your bank, from your banking app, uh, in order to help you manage your money better? When we ask a question like this, we always expect rates, fees, incentives to come through. So we would always expect customers to say, you know, I want, I want to get a higher rate on my savings. I would like my bank to give me money. Um, so we, we kind of expect that coming through. And that's what you see on the left-hand side there. But I think importantly, especially for that younger customer group, they're now starting to say, I want budgeting tools. And this is despite the fact that the budgeting tools that are in the market at the moment don't generally have very high rates of awareness, don't have very high rates of use. So even without customers starting to use these products in, in, um, in, a, in large quantities, customers are starting to say, I want that type of functionality. I want charts that show my spending. I want insights in how I'm spending. I want help to save more. Um, so this, I think, is where there really is a, a key opportunity for open banking, in particular amongst those younger customers who are struggling with this to a greater extent. There is a clear use case here. There is a clear benefit to customers. And I think um, aggregation services just on their own probably help to, to get part of the way um, or just that visibility of, of all accounts gets part of the way to helping customers with this, this point. Um, but if we can go further with open banking, if we can go further with CDR, this is, is a key proposition where customers are going to see value and, and, and that will change their perceptions around whether or not they're, they're comfortable with sharing their data. Just wrapping up those, those key points there before we jump into the panel. Um, we do see relatively low awareness of open banking. Um, understanding the benefits, uh, importantly, is even lower. So a very small proportion of consumers are actually able to understand what open banking or what CDR means for them or how it would work in practice. Uh, at a high level, consumers aren't really that comfortable with sharing their data, just if, you're, if we're talking about sort of broad benefits. Um, if they do see specific use cases, if they can understand how sharing their data benefits them, that changes things. Customers are then more willing, a lot more willing um, to share their data in order to access those types of services. Um, I think there's always a point here as well around if you ask someone directly, would you want to share your data? They're going to say no, but if there is a, a value exchange, um, and we see this with, with something like Facebook all the time, uh, if they see the value that they get by ticking a box, um, that does uh, change their perception, does make them more open to sharing their data in that way. And then finally, um, PFM budgeting, helping customers manage their money is a clear use case, I think, for open banking. It resonates with younger customers in particular who do struggle with managing their finances and are already beginning to ask for these types of tools without um, necessarily seeing them in action, without necessarily seeing, uh, or, or at least in a, in a widespread way, seeing um, how these tools will help them. They're already starting to ask for these types of features. Um, so I think those, those types of tools which open banking 
can really enhance. Um, that is, is, is where there's a clear use case, uh, especially for younger customers, um, and will also help to solve that customer pain point around financial management, giving customers more control of their money. So I think the initial use cases that we see in terms of open banking in Australia will probably be um, more aligned to what customers are looking for than what we've seen in the UK. So I think in that regard, we'll probably see customers starting to use open banking um, pretty quickly. Um, just to, on the aggregation piece as well, both Australia and the UK have customer bases that are that are highly um, multi-bank. So that even just that aggregation piece should make sense for both an Australian customer and a UK customer. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if we do see pretty quick adoption in Australia. And actually the other point is Australians um, are really quick to adopt new technology in general. We see really high rates of digital banking in Australia. Um, contactless took off here really quickly compared to the UK. Um, even mobile payments have, have taken off, off quite quickly in Australia compared to um, to other markets. The UK in London, mobile, mobile payments took off quickly, but not so much the rest of, um, of the country. So I think Australians are a sort of in, in, innovative bunch um, and we do like new technology and do like to try new technology. So. So, you know, core to the bank's mission is is um, helping customers with their financial well-being, um, consumers and businesses. And we've been looking at ways and delivering different ways of doing that, you know, since our creation more than 100 years ago. But more recently, we've announced and, and delivered things like Benefits Finder that um, help customers find, you know, money that they might have out there in the ecosystem, unclaimed super or government benefits or, or other things like that, delivered through the ComBank app. Uh, so it was only natural that we would you know, start with a simple um, you know, account balance aggregator sort of value proposition in the ComBank app. You know, we know um, particularly our younger customers are often logging into their app you know, 10 times a day. Um, and I imagine they're probably doing that across multiple banks if they've got you know, uh, different banking arrangements. Uh, and when we did our own research, um, you know, the, 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 it was very similar to you know, what Kate just presented, that they, they saw value in um, having all of their financial arrangements in one place. And then ideally what we'll obviously also do, you know, that's quite a rudimentary offering, is we'll start using, with their permission and their, their obviously the right consent, um, the transaction data from uh, their, any, any OFI arrangements that they have to feed into those other services that we offer them connected to their ComBank accounts, whether it be around helping them track their spend by the different categories, as sort of Eric just talked about, or extending some of the uh, benefits finder uh, type arrangements, again, with, with a richer amount of data. And you can see, again, as Eric touched upon, us being able to, with, again, with the right consents, and obviously it goes without saying, um, making it easier for them to, you know, open up new loan accounts or um, other uh, financial services products without having to go through the, the currently fairly you know, tedious process of sending a scans of statements or their other financial arrangements with other um, OFI. So it's really, you know, the, the early opportunity is just about doing what they do today, making it much simpler, removing some of the friction, you know, removing some of the, 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 the time cost associated with it um, uh, so that they, we become a much you know, um, more you know, easier to deal with uh, partner. And then I, I think over time you can extend it beyond you know, uh, existing use cases. Obviously, you know, at the moment there's going to be an opportunity to see if we, there are any correlations between some of the offerings and, um, that we're putting into market or offering our customers and changes in those wellbeing scores. And obviously there's a bunch of macro factors right, that uh, probably drive... Uh, how people feel a lot more than some of the micro factors that we can influence. But certainly we have, you know, we, 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 we sample with our customers when we deliver certain um, solutions to them, whether they feel that is contributing to, you know, helping, you know, them get that sort of uh, their sense of world financial well-being. And, um, and certainly we are seeing um, some positive uh, reaction to those things, particularly, as I mentioned before, benefits finder. But then, like I said, the, the macro factors play a big role and how we respond to those macro factors can also be really helpful. So through COVID, obviously, we were able to offer things like repayment deferrals and, ho and holidays and extent to our business customers, um, you know, uh, cash flow support you know, as their businesses were impacted by, by lockdowns and the like. 
Um, so obviously the macro factors are having a huge dampening impact on them, how they feel about their financial well-being, but we're able to hopefully mitigate that or moderate that through some of the other services that we're able to offer. And I would expect that we can um, extend those offerings with um, having greater visibility of their financial position through you know, ingestion of OFI data. So one of the things that we've been doing, obviously, is we uh, only in the last year we've turned on um, sort of quick business loans, digital, uh, entirely digital, you know, authorised and funded literally within minutes. Uh, but we've had to offer that to customers that we have a good, you know, good visibility of their um, their financial position, and and so we've said you, you need to have a transaction account, a business transaction account with us for at least twelve months. Um, you know, CDR will allow us to open that up to anyone who's got a business transaction account with any uh, of the participating banks in Australia, as long as they consent, um, you know, sharing that data with us, we'll be able to get the same view of them and so be able to offer them those services as well. Uh, thanks. There's two aspects to that, I guess. The first is whether we would like to move quickly. Uh, which we do, and the second is is how to move quickly, when when as you say we're we're quite a small institution, and the mutual most of the mutuals are sitting in a similar kind of boat where we're highly dependent on vendor partners, whether core banking, internet banking, fintechs, and whatnot, on on the ability to deliver these services. So we looked at at for example statistics out of the UK where upwards of 30% of, of millennials say they would consider leaving their bank if they don't provide them with, with financial management tools. So that is not a position that we want to be in. And I don't think it's a position any bank wants to be in from whether it's us or ComBank or, or anywhere in between. So we believe fairly firmly that we, that we want to be moving as quickly as we reasonably can. Um, we are, as I said, highly dependent on vendor partners, and we're working through a number of those uh, um, agreements and relationships now. Key to a lot of what we want to do uh, is integrating capability and services from different partners, including into and out of our core banking platform. And a lot of that then is dependent on APIs. So we're doing a lot of work on the technology side to to open up the the core banking system for for um, account information and whatnot through through uh, this API capability such that we can then integrate um, vendor partner um, software with our own uh, operational software to be able to deliver this seamless uh, service. So we look at the, the increasing rate, for example, of the use of the mobile phone for banking. The internet banking usage has been fairly steady uh, for, for a long time, um, but we're sitting in a position where internet banking proportionally is declining compared to, to mobile app. We're, we're now in a position where we have a, a higher percentage of users that are exclusively mobile app users versus exclusively internet banking users, and a surprisingly small percentage of people that use both. It, it's, it's quite surprising for me to see, I use both, um, but quite surprising for me to see how, how much greater it is people who use the, their mobile app exclusively. So if we want to provide... Um, um, open banking services through a vendor partner, we have to integrate it into the mobile app experience. Uh, and that's really where a lot of our emphasis is right now to deliver that capability through the phone. We haven't landed yet on how we're going to promote the services that we do provide. It's obviously too early to do so now. Um, but I think the key for us is that the, the reason why we're investing in open banking and, and these various financial management, financial literacy, financial empowerment kind of tools is for their benefit. It's, it's not for those ones, those tools are not for our benefit, they are for our customers' benefit. And um, they're being provided for, I guess, the right reasons. We're providing it because we feel it is best for them to be able to be empowered and to be able to have uh, agency over their their own funds. We we try not to be 
well, we can't be um, a price leader in, in most situations. And when we talk price, we're typically talking lending or term deposits. Um, term deposits are interesting. They're very, very fungible. People move their money around all the time uh, in and out of our bank, in and out of any other bank, wherever the rates are, are the best. Uh, lending is obviously a lot more complicated because you've got to go through the application process. I would foresee at some point in the future, not in the next year, but certainly at some point in the not too distant future, that it becomes just as easy to move a loan around as it would be to move a, uh, a term deposit around. Mm -hmm. Obviously, fundamentally different concept from the bank's perspective. Um, but where we look at this kind of open information with not just open banking, but but open you know finance when when you start to get service providers like the energy providers and the telcos and whatnot involved in in the delivery of this information and you combine that with comprehensive credit reporting and you combine it with advanced analytics um, on not just the last three months of statements but the last you know three years of statements from every bank that you've ever dealt with and from every product and service that you've ever got we will start to be building a much more um, comprehensive view of of the customer's financial situation and uh, certainly from looking backwards but ideally then with with AI tools then looking forwards and going you know predictively is this a, a customer that we trust and at that point I think we're providing valuable services to to the customer where we can say yes bring us uh, your loan because we will provide you with a better a better loan and ideally a better digital uh, experience through the app or or any other digital channel or any other channel that we're that we're working on. So it's very much a, a front of mind thing for us how the customer sees us, mm. um, uh, without of course ignoring their prudential responsibility to stay in the business and be you know profitable to some degree. because I think consumers really don't know the difference between screen scraping and CDR and the proportion of consumers who are using either is still quite low. So whether a customer understands um, what, they're, what they're doing when they're using something like screen scraping and how that would compare to CDR, I think that is one of the key um, education pieces that we still need to get to. So making sure customers understand what they're doing, what they're sharing, what benefits they get back. Um, I think the trust is important. Um, I'm a user of Frollo, and when you go through the Frollo experience using CDR, it does feel very secure. And I think some of that is about the way they're communicating to customers rather than necessarily being screen scraping versus CDR. It's giving customers that sense of this is an official process. You're, you have control over what you're sharing. You have the ability to, to revoke your consent. Um, so I think it's more about making sure customers feel in control of that process, whether it's screen scraping or whether it's CDR more so than than anything else um but we we know the if you lose customer trust it's really really hard to regain i think mm. facebook is the prime example of that we first started doing research and trust in different providers back in um and facebook's level of trust has, has not come back has not shifted since then um so once you lose customer trust and with something like data data sharing is incredibly important especially um in banking if you lose that customer trust if customers feel like they're not getting that um, that sense of security from you, it's really hard to regain. But I think there's always a point around people who are price sensitive are price sensitive and they will move for price. So there is a segment of the market who will come in because you're offering the best price on a savings account or on a mortgage. Um, but they're the same customers who are likely to switch again if they see another price elsewhere. So I think um, perhaps having better visibility of who those customers are, maybe that means that banks can spend more time on retention strategies for customers who who are um, perhaps more um, likely to to stay in to become longer term customers? I think there's you, we don't necessarily want to always be attracting um, those customers who are just going to switch out again. So I think um, maybe that's what we'll, we'll start to see more of in open banking. Um, I think as well there is just a point around um, that Eric and, and Albert both mentioned creating real customer value is how you keep customers loyal. Customers, um, especially customers who've been with their banks for a long time, they want 
that recognition of their loyalty. They do want to, sometimes it is a price, sometimes they want a better price than a, a newer customer. And that definitely plays into customers thinking, especially with, with mortgages and back book, front book pricing. Um, but I think a lot of the time customers just really want to be seen. So I've stayed loyal to you. I've demonstrated my loyalty to you as a customer and I want you to display that back as a bank. So I think um, that's probably where I would I would be suggesting there's there's opportunity to really reach those customers um, to meet their needs to provide the the right solutions to them and, and they're the customers who you want to keep that you that you know are, are loyal to you and you want them to remain loyal to you longer term customers want to be identified as different um, and so we, uh, we all talk about this but that sort of personalization is so important and i think cdr does help us with that the more we know about a customer uh, the more personalized and targeted and relevant we can be for them so um, you know, that is, I think, the the one of the, the, the big sort of uh, opportunities for us here. How can we be more personalised using, you know, the rich analytics and uh, the, the rich, uh, the array of uh, value propositions that we have, um, you know, so the customer believes that we, we understand them and we're delivering something that is right for them. And you know, CDR plays a very, very important role, I think, going forward. Mm. Personalised offers are one of those things that always get really mixed results in our surveys because customers assume a personalised offer is going to be what they're used to getting at the moment, which is a vague product which may somewhat meet their needs. But I think once you start to really deliver, here's a product that really does meet a customer problem, that really does meet your specific needs. And with CDR, meaning that you have a better understanding of who that customer is and what their needs are rather than just the the, the, um, the, the siloed view that you get at the moment, then that means that that personalization becomes really possible. Um, and as you said, I think customers really value that. This is about you know, bringing together different components um, of both things that we offer, but things that partners can offer um, to really differentiate our offering in the marketplace. So it's not just about price. And I think price will become less and less important over time because there'll be so many different things that we're able to differentiate on that will be of value to a customer. But uh, CBA talks about ecosystems because we do bank, you know, 11 million, you know, Australian consumers and, you know, let's say round up to a million uh, businesses. Um, you know, so we already have a, a, a large ecosystem ourselves. And it's really about, you know, connecting those consumers and those businesses across the different need, their individual needs uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a better way than we have in the past. Uh, and you see the businesses that have been really successful in the digital age, uh, whether they're locals like Afterpay or, you know, international players like the big tech platforms, what they've done, they've built, they've built those ecosystems uh, and they've stitched together uh, different capabilities, again, that they either have manufactured themselves or they've said someone else can manufacture that better than us and we'll serve them up um, on our, in our ecosystem, on our platform for the benefit of our customers. You know, we've made announcements in recent times in the health space uh, where we can, you know, we want to help patients from the very beginning of their, you know, their need you know, they want to search for a dentist or a physio or a doctor, so they can they can do that through a directory. They they book the appointment. Uh, they the the payment, which often often is the most painful part of the experience, more the, more painful than having a tooth extracted, um, becomes invisible uh, and and digital, and that's painful. But by the way, for everyone, for the patient and the provider. Um, uh, so we can we can you know, we 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 remove the pain associated by that, and then there's a platform and that ecosystem for that ongoing interaction between the patient and their provider. You know, it's it's time for your six monthly checkup, or there's a special if you book in for that massage, you know, this week for example. Um, mm -hmm. So there's no reason for them to leave our ecosystem. You know, from the you know the very beginning to the very end and repeat. Um, you yeah, know, we can we can serve them. And similarly, we've made you know, recent announcements in the shopping space. Um, and even today, if you read the fin uh, in the in the business banking space around invoice financing and partnering with Waddle and and, and Zero in that space. So, um, you know, the, the old days that we can build it all ourselves, and we've got to be we're a product house, and we're sort of thinking around individual needs. Um, I think are gone, and and competition's driving that. And things like CDR will further sort of drive that um, that change. And I think that's a that's a great outcome for Australian consumers and businesses. Obviously, there needs to be a pain point that we think we, we can address um, and that we're entitled to address. You know, we do our own research. We sort of test different concepts. And sometimes customers say, 
we will never buy that from you for whatever reason. Um, you know, Kate's point around increasing trust is right. We are seeing it. We're seeing it in our NPS scores, record highs. Um, you know, it's you know, over, you know in recent weeks. Um, uh, so we're winning back the trust of our customers, and we are highly trusted. But we're not always going to be where they want to buy a particular product or, or service or, or solution from. So are we entitled to play in that space? And we test that with our customers. Do we have any um, native capability that we can bring? Or you know, does it make sense for us to partner? Um, will, it, will it enhance um, you know, um, our attractiveness for customers so that we can obviously extend our relationship with them, make them more profitable? All those things are, are, are in consideration. But you know, we also have to choose. Um, we, we, we know we can't play in everywhere. Um, and so often the hardest conversations around, you know, you know, what are we stopping or what are we not pursuing if we're going to take on this new opportunity? And there are a bunch of initiatives that are sort of happening even outside of the regulatory space is, you know, liberating data. So once upon a time, the, you know, the uh, competitive advantage was in the data that you held, you know, um, uh, from your existing customers. That's no longer the competitive advantage. It's, it's how you use it. Um, you know, I think uh, Malcolm, you referred to another forum I was at recently and sort of talked about like, you could be the Venezuela of data, you can have all the data in the world, but if you don't have the right sort of uh, uh, mechanisms in place to exploit it, then it's useless to you. Um, and so having those analytics capabilities, um, you know, the AI capabilities and machine learning, and then the individuals, the people, you know, the data scientists, um, or the mindset of not just the data scientists, but the whole business to understand the value of data and how they can use it in building better value propositions and serving our customers. Like, that is fundamental. And that's an ongoing battle that we have around uplifting that capability, both the technology and the skill set of our, of our people. Um, and that's, I think, where the, the real race is at the moment in, 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 in uplifting uh, that capability. I wish I had Albert's deep pockets. Um, no, that really goes to the importance for us of, of partnering with, with vendors, fintechs and whatnot in order to access and deliver those capabilities because we're not in a position where we can hire, you know, a thousand data scientists or a thousand programmers to do, to do this kind of work for us. Um, and, um, and so we're highly, highly dependent then on those relationships and, more than that, from a sort of a technical perspective, the ability to to share data out and to share data, get data back in. When you look at, at data sovereignty and security issues, it's a lot easier when it's all in house. Um, uh, not to say that it's easy, but um, but where we're talking about partnering arrangements, then those other factors come into play as well. And so we then need to build quite a secure e ecosystem that incorporates partners outside the, the, the banking, our banking system and, and start to get those benefits being able to deliver, deliver to our customers from, in effect, from the outside to the inside. terms of transactional banking because a, a small business would be expected to have their accounting platform doing a lot of that work for them. But where we look at, at lending and the ability to access uh, funds, then, then we're absolutely seeing a position where more information provides us with the ability to do a better job of assessing a customer, a uh, small business customer um, for, for suitability for them of whatever type. Um, I'm not sure how much of that is going to fit into open banking uh, because, because I, I really believe that a lot of that tie-in is through their accounting information. Um, where you look at things like uh, um, company loans with directors as guarantors, you start to get into that territory that says, wait a second, that the personal side of, of that information is not in the accounting platform, then you can start to aggregate and get a, a sort of a whole of, of the environment picture over a small business with both the, the business itself and the people who are involved in the business. You can start, start to understand how valuable, let's say, uh, a guarantee would be from a particular director. Um, small, small business 
banking is a well any business banking is a is a tough world to get into no question about it um and and we certainly have a, a not insignificant exposure through both the west coast and the east coast uh, so we're certainly looking forward to opportunities to assist the customers with access, better access to that information. We see significant benefits. And I think um, at least you know, for the incumbents, I see actually tremendous value. Obviously, this was initially introduced to disrupt the incumbents and create you know, um, you know, easier passages for fintechs and, 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 um, and new entrants into the market, which it will. Uh, and that's a great thing. But the incumbents already have, you know, as we've been talking about, rich digital um, offerings and products. And this just opens up markets and remove friction from acquiring new customers. So I think there's tremendous value um, to participate both as a data holder, where you can work with partners, and as well as a as a you know as a data recipient. Um, we're embracing it as you can tell. Um, as we want to do it safely. Uh, we want to do it in a sustainable way, building strategic capability that can be leveraged in multiple ways, and that is expensive, even with CBA's deep pockets, and takes time. Uh, and I think that's been part of the journey of sort of educating all the stakeholders, particularly our friends in government around, you know, the challenges of doing it safely, but um, absolutely hugely beneficial. I think the, the importance to any institution is going to be uh, visible if you can move quickly. I think that if, if a bank doesn't move with a reasonable pace for integrating these new capabilities and services for the customer and for their own back office processing, then then you're going to be left in a position where uh, the customers that are willing to move and wish to move will move. And then you'll find that products and services won't be priced at a, at a competitive way. So it really is a case where um, I think everyone who wants to be in the stay in the business has to be on these services. And so it's in some respect, it's almost a defensive play to say so um, a bit like positive credit reporting, a comprehensive credit reporting, but you just have to be in it to, to play. But we see the value then on top of that to, to our customers and, and to ourselves from back office processing perspective and the ability to really engage more deeply with our customers and build a, a stronger, better, deeper relationship with those customers and, and with new customers that come on board for the, for the services that we offer. Um, going to one of the questions that was on the, the Q&A about, about what it takes to increase the awareness, and it, it sort of goes to the first question as well about the UK versus Australian experience. I think it's going to be instrumental for all of us in promoting these capabilities to be able to push forward to the customer what the value is to them. I think if, you, if, we, say, if we say, hey, we have open banking, uh, everyone will go and but if we say we can help you with this this management of your finance we can help you understand money better we can uh, we can help you get uh, better products and services we can help you integrate your uh, your whole economic environment of your other products and services outside of banking then they will see that value and then they will come on board